Good morning. We are here at the lab and we're going to see what's going to happen with those 11 fish that we caught on the river yesterday. This office uh, came into being in 1967 uh, after a passage of the Anadromous Fish Conservation Act in 1965. The state and federal agencies agreed that they wanted to work together to restore migratory fishes including American shad, river herring, Atlantic salmon most notably. Uh, it really focused on fish passage. Dealing with the migratory barriers in the Connecticut River Basin, which are extensive and date back in time to when the first settlers came here and began putting barriers up on tributaries for mechanical power for mills. That expanded greatly over time to include a barrier on the mainstem Connecticut River as early as 1798. O over history, there's been over 3,500 dams uh, erected in the Connecticut River Basin. I think that number's low. Many of them, many of the larger ones, of course, were converted to hydroelectric power. And so we have, obviously, uh, the mainstem dams um, have been impactful uh, for fish being able to reach historic spawning and nursery habitat. We stopped trying to restore Atlantic salmon due to um, a number of factors that were simply beyond our control, climate change, and certainly there were habitat impacts, but a, a tenfold decrease in marine survival rates that happened in the late 1980s to early 90s uh, made it really untenable. We, we couldn't overcome the losses that were happening at sea. Uh, American eel who interestingly do the opposite of all the other species I'll mention. Uh, American eel go to saltwater to spawn and then the juveniles come back. So that's a, it's a very unique species. That's at very low levels of abundance. And I and others do work trying to restore and improve uh, the, the situation for that species. The other species are, are anadromous species which come to freshwater to spawn. And so we've already mentioned American shad uh, which of course we have in the Connecticut River. We have blueback herring and alewife, and blueback herring and alewife are collectively referred to as river herring. The short-nosed sturgeon, which we have a reproducing population in the Connecticut River, uh, American shad, the blueback herring, the alewife, all-time low levels of abundance along the coast. We're fortunate in the Connecticut River for shad um, that our population is doing relatively well Holyoke Dam is located uh, at, at River Mile uh, 86, and that has a fish lift facility on it to pass fish upstream and downstream fish passage protections. You may be familiar with the concept of a fish ladder, but this hydroelectric facility has an even more elaborate system called a fish lift. So let's head up to the observation deck to watch the elevator in action. Then we can follow the fish to the viewing room to see what's coming through today.
This is early May and it's the middle of migration season, so it's a great time to take the public tour. These fish are mostly American shad, along with a few other species mixed in, including this sea lamprey on its way toward spawning habitat further north. We also have sea lamprey, which are a misunderstood and misappreciated species, and they serve an ecological role. So sea lamprey are parasite. They are not parasitic in their anadromous phase in the Connecticut River. They're just coming here to spawn. At the end of our electrofishing episode, I promised you'd have a chance to see how the bodies of the sampled fish reveal their life histories. So let's take a look at a tiny ear bone extracted from a river herring. These ear bones are called otoliths, and they help the fish orient itself in the water. When we look at these, we're basically, you're looking at them like you would read tree rings, very similar to tree rings, slow growth and rapid growth. So if you look here, here's your nucleus, the center, right here is the core. So then we'll go out from the core to where we have it. You can see the little yellow dots indicate where we think the year ends. But you have a large amount of growth on that first year and a large amount of growth on the second year. And we see that in these species. The first two years, you're going to see rapid growth, a lot of growth. And then as time goes on, the growth rates slow down. And this is where it gets harder to age them because all those those years, let me try to find one, those years, like in an older fish, like a nine-year-old, you can see the, how tightly packed those get right there on those later years. And that that's the difficult part. That can be a difficult part is deciphering what you think is a year or and, and what isn't because what we're looking for it's a very strong, distinct mark, like I'm following right here. That's what you want to see. A year's growth, that, that end of the year is going to be a um, tightly packed, darker, dense layer of the, of the otolith. The otoliths are created with their, their um, calcium carbonate crystals, basically. The fish take them in through salts, minerals, uh, the food they eat. As the fish grows, matures, it lays down layers of these crystals. So reading, reading them in zones, um, light and dark, light zone, rapid growth, those dark bands that we call the end of the year are the tightly packed bands, uh, layers rather, that's slow growth. and. Our ages, it's probably average four years old, right around there. Um, another thing, here's another thing that ages can tell us from a system, whatever river it is, is that if, you, if we're, say, plucking a lot of three-year-olds out of a system, it's just consistently three, four-year-olds, and we're not seeing six, seven, eight-year-olds, a balance, of the age, a good distribution, um, that kind of raises more questions than gives us answers. But it, it, it says these fish are surviving to return because typically they want to come back every year. You know, why is that? So the ear bones can tell us the age of a fish, and it turns out we can also learn how many times that fish has reproduced by looking at its scales. Spawning is a very difficult, stressful time for them. They're not feeding, they're reabsorbing their scales, and on those scales they leave a dark band, a dark mark. And then we can, we can actually compare the two. I can say, well, I got a six-year-old, for example, a six-year-old uh, blueback herring here. How many years did it spawn? And we can go back and we can look, one, two, maybe three years. So let's go downstairs to take a look at the scales. Kyle is preparing the new batch of scales, letting them soak in a cleaning solution, while he shows me some of the older slides, 
projected onto an old school microfiche machine. Uh, while that's sitting, we can look at the uh, results of some stuff we've cleaned. This guy is the microfiche, and uh, as you can see, it's very old. This is an alewife fish, growing the scale out and out as it uh, gets older, and you can see like a lot of these lines in here, and, and each of them represents a point in time in the fish, and you can see kind of them spiraling out sort of like a tree ring does as it gets older. But we're interested mostly on the edge of the scale. So, if you can see right here, there's this jagged, scratchy section. These little uh, burn marks, because the fish is actually just eating away at that scale as it's going upriver to try to get as many nutrients as it possibly can. This is actually the part that's on the inside of the fish. That's what's actually connected to the fish's tissue. And this is on the outside. And you can kind of see, you know, that's the part that we usually see. And that's all on the inside or covered up by another scale. And so since we're only seeing one mark here, we can say with confidence that this is probably a fish that has respawned one time already. This is probably its second time coming up the river. Now, finding, finding a fish that has three repeat spawn marks is very rare. Uh, I think... Only 1% of the fish we found last year had three marks, which is just, you know, absurdly low considering we caught almost 1,200 fish to study. On each of these slides, we take eight scales so that we can look at other ones and try to compare our results together. It's got like all of that fish slime on here, and that's what we're trying to get off. And so the solution, this pancreatin solution that's sitting in, has done a really good job at loosening it. And all we really need to do is rub it in a little bit of water dry it off, and then we're able to sort of just rub the slime off gently. And as you can see, it'll start to get really clear and transparent, and that's what we want to see. And like I said, we like to do eight of these at a time, just so that we have a lot of scales to look at when we're analyzing. It's also really important to not get any tape over the scales. But yeah. That's the finished product. Gonna be doing about 1,500 of those. <laughs> Finally, let's see how the ear bones, scales, and other useful parts are extracted from the fish we collected on the electrofishing boat the day before. And these fish are still kind of covered in slime and goo, so we just like to wipe them off first, and get it nice and clean. So we determined that this could be an alewife just because this eye is, is very large. Usually when we're on the boat, the way we determine whether the fish is an alewife or a blueback is based on the eye size. If it's got a bigger eye, it's an alewife, and a smaller eye is a blueback. This top fish is an alewife. It's got that big, big eye. You can see that lower fish has a smaller eye. So we, we believe this to be a blueback, this bottom fish, and this top fish to be an alewife. Uh, first step is to take a scale sample, and we like to do that from the top half of the fish, just because that's uh, less likely to be damaged. Try to find like an undamaged part of the fish, and it's usually on the top, and we'll just, you know, scrape the knife perpendicular. Get a good amount of scales in the knife. Put it in the envelope. Uh, they're going to need to be cleaned with a solution and mounted on a slide. Uh, so next is checking species and sex. So we're gonna go from the vent of the fish right here and make a cut all the way up to the head. And that'll allow us to look inside. So we're looking in here. There's a lot of things going on, but the most important thing is seeing this organ right here. This is, these are testes, and they have like this white kind of creamy color. That shows us it's a male. If this was uh, orange and kind of had little eggs in it, then we know it was ovaries and a female. And then the second thing is this very thin protective layer in here. Uh, this is called the peritoneum. You can see that this is kind of a nice light, light uh, white color. So that means this is an alewife fish. Uh, if this was like a dark gray, and we'll see that later, that would mean it's a blueback. So we'll take a gill sample and we'll use that in the Cronin lab down the road to see if there's any parasitic glycidia muscle larvae on them. So we have a lab that looks at 
parasitic muscle larvae that live on the gills. And the way they work is, in usually mid-May, the mussels will kind of, they'll sit on the bottom of the Connecticut River, and they will attract fish to them by, by like showing something or wagging something in the water. And the fish will kind of come and check it out. So if this is the mussel and this is the fish, you know, it'll kind of do stuff. And the fish will come down. And then the mussel will uh, eject a bunch of like glochidia, their, their little babies, in the fish's face. And the fish will kind of go, Hugh! and the mussels will enter through the fish's mouth and attach right onto the gills. And they'll stay there for, for a while until they're big enough to fall off. And they'll just parasitize on the fish. We removed the first gill arch on the left and right side. These fish bodies are also used. We have a rehabilitative raptor guy that comes and picks up these fish, and he'll feed them to his ospreys and eagles that he's rehabilitating. And we also have someone in the office, Corey, from yesterday, who is potentially looking to start a study on fat analyses in these fish, so we're saving them for him too. So every part of the fish gets used. We can look at a blue back, or what we think is a blue back next, fish number seven. So uh, one really important thing that we do is uh, to make sure we don't cross-contaminate scales. We have to make sure that the knife that we use is completely clear of scales, just so we don't get scales from another fish that would confuse us later. group of scales. So now this is where we check sex and uh, species. So we've got another male. You can see there's the testes there. They're that clear, or not clear, but opaque white organ. And now we can see this peritoneum is completely different. This is a super dark color um, and that signifies that it's a blueback. So we were right in that analysis. So let me try to just instead scalp this guy. Don't get the gruesomeness of the head. So this is this is the brain right here. We're not looking in there, so we can just kind of pull that back. So in here, we got our spinal cord again, right right here connected to the brain. You can kind of see in here these these little structures. They're a little bit clearer than the rest of the body. That's the Oda capsule. That's where we're going in. So you can just kind of grab that and pull it out. And just like that, that Olith is sitting right on top. There's our other one. Okay. And these will go up to Darren in the lab for analysis. And then the last thing is taking those gills. So we can lift under here, kind of expose the gill under the gill plate. So when we're looking at these for uh, Glochidia, we're looking for a bunch of little spots all over. It's still a little early for the Glochidia to show up on these gills, so we're probably not going to be seeing any. Usually they come in the middle of May. That's when the mussels are starting to attract the fish to them. For that mussel study, we're looking at endangered mussel species that are oh. using the fish as a, a parasitized source. So this one, I believe, is female. One of the things that kind of clues me in that it's a female is you can see, if we're looking on this fish, this is sort of like bulging out. And I think these should be ovaries that are very, very full of uh, eggs. Uh, or this guy on the right is a male, this is a female. And you can see that on the underside, this one's way fuller. And that'll, that's your first clue in that's a female. It's a gravid female, full of eggs. I want to make sure to not cut open the ovaries because we want to try to get as much of it as possible for our weight analysis so we can get an accurate reading. So, go in from the vents. Now you can already see there's a giant difference between that like opaque white testes and these ovaries. These are bright orange. And you can see all the little eggs in there. This is a quite gravid fish. But the peritoneum looks light, doesn't it? It does look a little light. However, if it was 
an alewife, then this would just be all very clear. Since it has any bit of this dark color, we know that it's um, at least partly a blueback. They do hybridize, so we could say this is a hybrid. However, I'd be more apt to classify it as a blueback just because those hybrids are so rare. Remove the ovary connective tissue from the rest of the fish. Again, try to make sure we get as much of it as possible. So that's sort of a full ovary right there. And that's just one side of it. So put that in the bin. Get the other one. Okay. So that's pretty, pretty full. It probably accounts for about a fifth of the fish, which is a lot of weight. Yeah. It's a lot of eggs. I'm sure a falcon would love to eat that. <laughs> Blueback herring historically range from, from the river mouth all the way up to the Bellows Falls Dam, and that's located up in Vermont, New Hampshire. So quite a, quite a migratory distance. Um, so as, as you go downstream, we have a number of important tributary systems uh, that we're working to restore American shad, river herring, sea lamprey, and eels. Again, a lot of uh, hydroelectric and uh, projects and other dams and barriers to be dealt with. Unfortunately for the river herring, what we've seen over a period of time is uh, a dramatic decrease in their abundance up and down the Atlantic coast, but again, we're talking about the Connecticut River here. We've never recovered, and uh, it's, it's disturbing and disappointing. And that's what my study uh, was designed to address, that the Connecticut River didn't have the data that was needed for management purposes. The key metrics that we use to manage these populations, which is our, our obviously abundance, but it's also um, the age structure of the population, uh, the uh, size, growth rates, whether or not the fish have spawned before, because again, these fish can repeat spawn. That's a very important metric. As you move northward, there should be more older age fish in the population. And, and right now, the vast majority of the fish that we have in our system, 85% are fish that are uh, younger than age six. And so one of the management goals that we, we talk about would be to increase that age structure, to have representation of seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old fish. I mean, there are records of these fish being 15 years old. You can't find that anywhere up and down the coast, but historically, they could be 15 years So old. the older ones, do they have larger gonads and make more babies? They absolutely do, and and you're, that that's an important observation to make. Not only... Uh, it, that the, the female's reproductive capacity doesn't increase in a straight line. It's an actual exponential increase. So there's a dramatic increase in the reproductive capacity of females as they get larger and older. The monitoring is going to help inform what we can do for restoration and whether or not restoration is going to work. So the, so the next steps for this would be to develop some, some strategies to see if we can improve the status. And so examples of that, I'm, at the moment, uh, I'm not so interested in the hatchery-based restoration, uh, but myself and others are interested in, in uh, adult stock transfers where you move fish that are getting ready to spawn into unutilized but accessible habitat. Well, thank you for your interest in our science and wildlife content. The Connecticut River is a topic that I intend to cover in future videos as well, including community science and service projects with the Connecticut River Conservancy, and the removal of some dams on tributaries of the Connecticut River as part of a wildlife conservation effort. And I'll link to a few other videos that we've done in the past that you might be interested to see.